Uh oh. Good morning. Oh, you can always count on Hazel to hype you up. So that's great. Um, good morning, guys. It's great to be together. Uh, I'm Davion Hamburg. For those of you that probably don't know me, I know we have a lot of new faces here. Destiny's friends are here from town. So welcome. She's been raving about you guys, so it's, it's, it's good that you're here. Uh, I'm glad you're visiting here with us. Uh, I'm going to say a prayer, then we'll just jump right in. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Holy Father, God, thank you so much for this morning. God, thank you for the singing. Thank you for the worship. God, thank you for the people in this room and the opportunity that we have to come together to worship you collectively as one body, God. I pray that uh, this morning your, your word is, is spoken. God, I, I pray that uh, our hearts are prepared to receive what you have to say, God. I pray that we can walk out of here feeling closer to you, Father, feeling inspired, um, God, feeling challenged if we need to, feeling comforted if we need to, or whatever else that you think that we need, God. I, I pray that um, your word can uh, help us to get there. And so, Father, we're grateful for you. Thank you so much for who you are, God. Thank you for loving us perfectly, uh, unconditionally. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. All right, guys, turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to keep going here in our study of Hebrews, and we're going to be in verse 13 through 20. And we're going to talk about hope today. And, yeah, and, you know, I think that's, uh, it's, it's one of those, hope is one of those things that it's almost like you either have it or you don't, you know? I think there, there's things in life that we feel hopeless about. You know, there's things in life, obviously all of us, right, we have different circumstances, things that we experience, things that we deal with that really affect the level of hope that we have. Um, some people feel hopeless, right? When you look at the world around you, you look at the circumstances going on, you know, it's easy to feel hopeless. It's easy to, to think, okay, who do, I, who do I put my hope in? Where do I put my trust? Because, you know, the politicians, they're, ain't, they're, they're not going to do it. That ain't it, right? Uh, broken promises, lies, deceit, greed, bribes, whatever, right? You, you look at human beings in general and you think to yourself, we're, we're done for, right? Uh, it, it's not easy to, to have hope there, right? And, and you think about, okay, where, well, where do I put my hope? Who do I trust in? Whose promises can I trust in, right? The kingdom kids or the, you know, the people that grew up in the church, if you're spiritual, you're probably like, ding, 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 God. Yes, that's the correct answer. Um, and we're going to talk about why we can hope in God this morning, right? What, what makes God, you know, what, what reasons are there for, for us to be able to put our hope in God? What about God enables us to hope in him with confidence, and that's the thing, right? Sometimes when you put hope in a person, it's kind of it's kind of risky. You're like, I I don't know if if they're gonna they're gonna follow through, right? People are people. People are sinful, you know. And so there's that risk. There's that level of fear associated with putting your hope in people. But sometimes we can feel that way with God too. You know, I appreciate Kevin's Kevin's contribution. It's so true, right? When we give. Right When we tithe and we give our money, we want something in return, something tangible. I need to see proof that this money that I'm giving is going to go towards something or whatever, right? And I, I think at times we can feel that way with God. Like, Man, I, I want to put my hope in God, but I don't know if I'm going to see the things that I want to see, you know, because God obviously is intangible. We can't see him or touch him or physically hear him. So what is it about God? that enable, enables us to put our hope in him with confidence. And so we're going to look at that today. We're going to talk, some, talk about that a little bit here. The title of my message this morning is Anchored on the Promise. And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. And the author is writing here to some discouraged Christians. They're discouraged by their circumstances. They're discouraged by the pressures that they face from the people around them. The temptation to revert back to Judaism you know, perhaps the, the promises that they had hoped for, they had hoped to see, hadn't come to fruition yet. And so there was this temptation to kind of revert back to the way things used to be. Business as usual. And the author here wants to remind them 
of the certainty of God's promise. So let's start here in verse 13. It says, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. You know, there's, there's two main thoughts that I want us to walk away with, that I think God wants us to walk away with this morning as we, as we look at this passage. And the first one is this, is you can hope in God because he is unchanging. God is unchanging. In fact, God is the only one that is unchanging. And the author says, God, God wants you to realize and recognize the unchanging nature that he has. So you can be confident. You can put your hope in God. You can trust in God. You can trust in the promises that he offers because he is unchanging. The people in your life, they change. They go back and forth, right? Nobody likes a liar. Nobody likes a deceiver. Nobody likes someone who goes back on their word. You think about that. You know, think about when someone makes a promise to you. They swear an oath. I swear I will do this. And then they don't do it. You liar. You know, it's just like, what? Who, who am I supposed to trust in? And that's, that's what we face with people, right? And, and sometimes, you know, look, we're flawed, we're sinful, we try to be honest. I'm not saying there's not honest people out there. There are honest people out there. But everybody at some point has wrestled with this, right? We have a changing nature. When our circumstances change, we sometimes tend to change. God, no matter the circumstances, is always the same, always unchanging, the author says here that, man, God, when he, when he promised Abraham to bless him, there was no one greater for God to swear by. So he swore by himself. He says, I, I put this on me. I'm God, and I'm swearing by my own name that I will do this. And what was the result? Abraham waited patiently until he received what was promised because he was certain. It's like, oh, well, God swore by himself. So, of course, it's going to happen. Right? That, that, that level of certainty, that level of trust, and it was almost just like it was easy for Abraham to trust God. He was, he's reminding the Hebrew, the Hebrew audience that that is the God that we serve. That when God makes a promise, he keeps his promises. When God swears an oath, he holds to that oath. In fact, there are two things in which it is impossible for God to lie. He says that here, right? God wanted to make his unchanging nature so clear to the people that, you know, he was blessing to the people that uh, were, were faithful to him that he says, hey, not only am I going to make a promise, I'm going to swear an oath. And when you think about that, right, you think about an oath and someone swearing an oath, right? Why do we swear oaths? Isn't it to kind of convey the severity of how committed we are? Right? Like, you know, I, I told my wife, you know, I, I'm going to love you till the day that we die, till death do us part. That was my vow. Right? I swore an oath to her before God. It's like, hey, I'm going to do this no matter what. This is serious to me. I'm committed to this. No matter what, no matter the circumstances, I will be your husband and I will love you no matter what. And she said the same thing to me. Right? Now, you would hope that we would hold to those oaths, which we have for almost four years now, so we're going strong. 
you know, we're, we're holding. A lot of you guys have been holding to your oaths a lot longer than we have. But, you know, you swear an oath to convey the, the seriousness and the importance of the promise that you're making. Right? So God swore an oath. He said, I'm going to bless you, and you know what? I'm going to swear an oath by myself, by my own name. And in those two things, it is impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie about his promises, and it's impossible for God to lie about oaths. He cannot do it. You think about who God is, all things are possible with God except that. God does not lie. And the author wants the the Hebrew audience here to be encouraged by that. Man, you can hope in God because he does not lie. He is not changing. And I think for us, this should should greatly encourage us as well. Amen? I mean, you, you think about all of the things that you feel hesitant about, right? All of the ways that, it, that, that it's hard to have hope. It's hard to know who to put your trust in. It's hard to know who to hope in. Man, but we have a God that is unchanging. He doesn't switch up. Human beings are ever-changing, always switching up or code switching, as the kids say these days. Code switching, they, you know, one moment they're acting one way and then the next they're acting another way, right? Depending on the circumstances or the setting. Switching codes, I, you know, I don't know entirely what that means, but that's what they say. I don't know, if you can, you can ask Vaughn to explain it to you, I'm sure. So. <laughs> Vaughn knows a thing or two about code switching. <laughs> I'm just playing. Vaughn is not a code switcher. With Vaughn, what you see is what you get. But, you know, no, human beings, people, people always switch up, right? But not God. God is not like human beings. He doesn't change. It's impossible for him to lie. It's impossible for him to go against his oath. God does not break his oath when he swears his oath. And my question to you this morning, church, is how convinced are you that God's nature is unchanging? How convinced are you of the certainty of God's promises? I think it's easy, right? We can, we can look at the, at the Bible, look into the scriptures. We see these promises that God lays out, right, and think, man, that sounds great. On a logical level, yeah, I get it. I agree with it. But man, I mean, on a heart level, are you convinced in your heart, in your mind, man, God made this promise, and he's going to keep it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope in him. I'm going to trust in him. You know, I think about some of the promises that I've felt uncertain about. And I'm just going to list a few of them off here. You know, you see lots of promises, obviously, throughout the scriptures. But uh, some of my favorite ones, but also the hardest ones for me to really be convinced of, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, right, which is Jesus saying, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. That's kind of hard sometimes for me. I want to go everywhere else but to Jesus sometimes to find my rest. Am I really convinced that I'm going to feel refreshed, rejuvenated when I go to Jesus for my rest? Matthew 6, right? Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and everything you need will be given to you. Ooh, that's tough. I want to do things my way sometimes. I want to take matters into my own hands. But, you know, I have to ask myself, do I really believe that Jesus is going to meet every single one of my needs if I seek the kingdom first? Probably my favorite one and the hardest one for me to believe is, you know, Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 10, and this is kind of my, my, my why for being in the ministry. Why I want to be in the ministry, uh, why, why I feel like, you know, God put that on my heart. But, you know, Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. That was a hard one for me to believe for a long time, that Jesus wants to give me life to the full, that doing things God's way is going to lead to the most fulfilling life that I will ever get to experience. Ooh, that one, right? Even now, even today, there are times where I can, I can struggle with this. There are times where I get tempted. 
to, to think, man, maybe if, I, maybe if I invested in this worldly thing, I would feel more fulfilled. Maybe if I had spent more time over here doing this, I would feel a, a, a better sense of fulfillment or excitement or enjoyment from my life. These are promises that I've had to fight to be faithful in. I have to trust that God is going to come through with those promises. And, you know, I, I think that's, that's why I'm still here today is because I believe in the promises of God. I trust in his unchanging nature. A lot of people in this room, right, have been disciples, followers of Jesus, Christians for decades. You don't do that if you're not convinced. You, you, you don't do that. I mean, sure, you could probably fake it, you know, and I, I think God will expose that. But, man, you can't be faithful for that long if you aren't certain that God's promises are true. If you aren't positive that God's nature is unchanging. And I, I think our certainty, our level of certainty of who God is, of how unchanging he is, of how faithful he is to fulfilling his promises, that's going to affect how we wait. You know, Abraham was able to wait patiently. He didn't get his blessing right away. He had to wait a little bit. But he trusted God. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter how long I have to wait. Even if I'm past the age of, of having a kid, even if my wife is past childbearing age, God's unchanging. He said, I'm going to have a kid. I'm going to have a kid. And he did. And there was an entire nation that stemmed from him. God kept his promise, but he waited patiently, right? How do you wait? I think how we wait, it, it, it's, it's an indicator of how certain we are of God's nature. If we're hasty, like, oh, you know, I'm getting kind of antsy. Things aren't happening the way that I want. Things aren't happening when I want them to happen. You know, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going I'm to go and do things my way, right? That's probably a sign that we don't really trust in who God is. We don't trust in his unchanging nature and the certainty of his promises. Man, but if we can wait patiently and be at peace no matter the circumstances, that's a sign that we trust in God, that we're convinced of his unchanging nature. You know, like I shared, like I shared earlier, I, I doubted God's promises for me. Uh, for a long period of time, specifically when I was in college. And my, one of my biggest struggles in college was the world just looked so appealing. It looked really appealing. I, I became a Christian at 18. Um, right after I left my parents' house, got to college, some, someone shared their faith with me, studied the Bible with me, and I decided to become a Christian um, in 2010. But as I was living out my discipleship, I was like, I was, I was seeing people in the world, and I was thinking to myself, man, that looks kind of nice. I never really got to experience that. And my big struggle was parties. One of my biggest struggles was parties and purity. Those were my two biggest sins. But, you know, on the party aspect of things, I just wanted to go and have fun. I was like, it just looks nice to be carefree and just to go and just to drink and just to be around people who just are living it up. To me, that looked like life to the full for a period of time. And so, you know, I started making little compromises. And that's always how it is, right? You don't just, you don't just like jump in. Sometimes you do, but typically it's like you compromise a little bit and then eventually you just kind of find yourself like, how did I get here, right? And for me, the compromise was my friends. I started hanging around people more and more who weren't trying to be like Jesus. And I, I, I tried to convince myself, okay, well, I need to be a light to them. So, you know, who's going to be a light to them if I'm not hanging out with them? But it's like, you are who you hang around. And so if I'm spending the majority of my time around people who like to party and get drunk, then guess who's going to be influenced? You know, more than likely it's me. Um, but that was my compromise, right? So I, I started hanging out with them more. Not necessarily going to parties and stuff, but let's just hang out more. You know, ah, friends in the church, they want to hang out. They want to go pray together or something like that. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, and we're just going to go do whatever, you know. And then eventually that turned to 
all right, now I'm going to start drinking with them. And I was like, oh, it's fine. I'm of age, so it's okay for me to drink. It's not a sin, right? And they're drinking maybe a little bit too much. I'll just have one drink, right? And then one drink would turn into like three drinks. And then eventually it's like, okay, well, now I'm getting drunk with them, and, and that's fine. So, you know, it's, it's whatever. I know this is sinful. I'll confess it, you know, but I'm still going to do it. And then eventually that turned to, okay, now I'm just like full out. I'm just going to parties with them. You know, I, I made some friends in the country, and we would drive down to the country and just party. And I thought, this is great. This is fun. This is exciting. But I slowly and slowly and a little bit over time just started to doubt that God would give me life to the full. And I started to look for life to the full in other places. I started to look for it in the party scene. Eventually, after drinking myself literally into a stupor, ruining my reputation among my friends who I told I was a Christian. They're like, oh, you're a Christian and you're like blackout drunk here? Like, okay, I guess that's, I was like, just destroyed my reputation with some of my friends. I just have to sit back and take a, take a, a, a cold, hard look at where I was at. And I realized, man, is this it? Is this life to the full? You know, do I want to be doing this when I'm 30, which I am this year? You know, do I want to be doing this when I'm in my 40s? Do I expect to be married and, you know, to be a father and still doing this kind of, is this really life to the full? This can't be life to the full. You know, and I'm grateful for the brothers that were in my life. They were patient. When I say patient, they were patient with me. Um, but they, they really helped me to repent and to get back on track. And they helped me to be convinced that God's promises were worth hoping in. They helped me to be convinced that I could trust in what God said. That, man, God said he's going to give me life to the full. He's going to give me life to the full. So I got to do my part. I got to trust him. I would encourage us to think about this this morning. What promise from God do you have a hard time believing? What promise? There, there are promises all throughout the scriptures. Is there a promise that you feel hesitant to be fully confident in? You know, I love the examples in the scriptures. Joshua says in Joshua 21, 45, not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. The angel in the Gospel of Luke says, no word from God will ever fail. James says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. What, what, what promise do you have a hard time taking God at his word? Let's keep reading here. We'll finish it out in... Verse 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. You know, I think the second major thing that the author wants us to take away here is that hope in Jesus anchors our souls in heaven. I love how he, he uses this term forerunner. The Greek word for that is, is prodromos, and that literally means like a military scout. So someone who goes ahead of the rest of the pack and they scout out the land. They, 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 they do reconnaissance. And they report back and say, hey, here's what I've seen. You know, here's what's there. Here's what you need to be aware of. Follow my example, and you'll be good. We'll have victory. I've taken stock of everything that's there. So I know exactly what needs to be done. I know exactly how it needs to be done. I know exactly when it needs to be done. And if you follow me to a T, you'll be good. And that's what Jesus is for us. He's our forerunner. 
right? He's gone ahead of us. The author says he's gone behind the curtain in the sanctuary. He intercedes for us. He, fall, he, he sets the pace, right? He sets the example for us to follow. And so he's saying, hey, because Jesus is your forerunner, your hope can be in him. Your hope can be in your forerunner, Jesus. And that hope in Jesus anchors your soul. That hope is an anchor. Right? And we know what anchors are used for. They, they keep us from drifting. They keep a ship from drifting. You don't want to dock your ship and not let down your anchor because then you won't have a ship. And a lot of people will get mad at you. Wasted their money or your own money, right? But, but the anchor helps to prevent us from drifting. And the interesting thing is that anchors are only effective when they're unseen, right? You think about, you think about what's that scripture, Hebrews 12, right? Hope that is, is seen is, is no hope at all. Anchors, if you can see an anchor, it's not doing its job, <laughs> right? So, right, Jesus is unseen. Our hope in Jesus is unseen. But, man, that's where the faith comes in. That's where the trust comes in, right? You got to trust that Jesus is your forerunner. You got to trust that he's gone before you, that he's paved the way, that he's interceding on your behalf to God. And earthly anchors go down. But our spiritual anchor goes upward, right? It, it, it prevents us from drifting too far away from God. It helps, it helps to keep us in place, right? Sometimes we can drift a little bit, but then eventually that anchor tugs on you. You're like, oh, I got it. Let me, let me go back, right? I was drifting a little bit. My anchor tugged on me through my friends. They're like, bro. You're being an idiot. Why go back to your vomit? It's my anchor. They're helping me to stay anchored to God. Where are you anchored this morning? Where is your anchor? Is your anchor in heaven or is it here on earth? Is your hope in Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross and his resurrection? The fact that he's gone before us and intercedes on our behalf? Or is it somewhere else? I think we're either, we're, we're anchored in one of two places. There is no gray area. I think as, as people, we like to create gray areas, right? Like, well, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle. Well, not, not necessarily here. You are either anchored in God or you're not. If we're just keeping it real, right, just like you're either saved or you're not, there is no in-between. The good thing is that everybody can be saved. Everybody can be anchored. So even if you're not saved, yeah, God can save you. Even if you're not anchored in God, you can still choose to anchor yourself in God. But there is no gray area. Everyone in this room this morning is anchored somewhere. You are either anchored on earth or you're anchored in heaven. And here's how you can tell. The person that's anchored in the world, they are fixated on earthly treasures, earthly circumstances, earthly things. Like Jesus said, right, their treasures are here in this world where moths and vermin destroy. The person who is anchored in the world is devastated and paralyzed when things don't go according to plan. When we make our plans, we have our hopes and our dreams, but then things don't go the way that we want, and we feel like the world is over. It's probably a sign that your anchor is not in heaven. And they drift toward the world rather than towards God. It's like a, it's like a steady, it's either a steady incline or decline. It's like, man, are you drifting more towards sin? Or are you drifting more towards God? And you can see that in a person's life. That's what repentance is, right? We, we see repentance by what a person does. The person that's anchored in Jesus, they're not overly attached to anything in this world. They know that their treasure is in heaven. 
They're able to be at peace when life doesn't go according to plan. And they're always drifting towards God rather than the world. Where do you fall this morning? I think we gotta take we gotta take stock of where we're at. You know, I think sometimes we can unintentionally put our anchor in something else. And I think these guys were starting to unintentionally put their anchor somewhere else. And the author's like, no, don't do that. Make sure that your anchor is in Jesus. Your anchor is in the hope of what Jesus has done. You know, I want to lift up uh, Carl Herbold. I feel like he's a prime example of this. I'll never forget the example that he set. When, you know, right before the pandemic hit and he lost his job, You know, talk about being anchored in heaven. The brother was faithful. He he could have had every reason to drift away from God. He could have had every reason not to trust in God because his circumstances didn't go according to plan. It's not like he asked for that to happen. But he stayed faithful. He stayed committed. Matthew 6, 33 was his mantra. And it showed by the way that he lived his life. It showed by the way that he worked. It showed by the way that he invested in his family and in his kids. Man, it shows today. Right? He's still here. Still faithful. God blessed him. God blessed his family. Mason's an awesome disciple. Right? But I just think about, man, he he waited patiently for the promise. God's going to provide for me. That's what happens, right? When we're anchored in heaven... Man, we can trust that God is going to come through. You know, I want to leave you with a challenge this morning. The first one I already mentioned, right? Figure out, man, what, what promise from God do you need to be fully convinced of? Is there a promise? Is there something in God's word that you have a hard time trusting in? And the second thing I want to leave you with is, what is one thing you can do to anchor yourself more firmly in Jesus. Anchors can get loose. What do you need to do to firm, make that anchor in Jesus more firm? To make it more solid. Don't fall into the trap of letting your hope be in men. Right? We serve a God who is unchanging. We can always expect God to be the same. I think that's one of God's best qualities. It's one of his best qualities, second to him loving us unconditionally and wholeheartedly. But he never changes. What you see with God is what you get. You see that in the Bible. God is always the same. He always longs for people to come to repentance. He always longs to enter into a relationship with every single one of his kids. He longs to be in heaven with each and every one of us, and that never changes. But don't buy into the lie that being anchored to the things of this world are going to bring you peace and security. Your status, your job, your academics, your relationships, none of those things will bring you the security that only Jesus, our forerunner, can. Nothing in this world. And we've got to become convinced of that. And I want to close with this scripture here in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 through 8. It says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. That's what it looks like to be anchored on the promise of God. Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Thanks, Davion, uh, for that lesson. Yeah, I feel like it was uh, just inspiring. You know, I think just the questions that you asked of like, you know, what promise do you struggle to trust in? And just like this idea that, man, like, it's true. Like, all of God's promises will be fulfilled. You know, like, his word is is unfailing, right? He cannot lie. And um, yeah, just like this idea of like, what, what promise do I struggle to trust in? You know, because, you know, there are times where I, 
I struggle in my faith. And it's like, okay, what promise am I not believing in in those moments? And so I really appreciate that. And just like the the visual of like, man, our anchor, right? It's like no matter how strong like the, the water is moving, you know, if our anchor is in, in Jesus, we won't drift away. You know, like he will keep us, you know, we might, we might move a little bit, but it's like, no, we're, we're going to stay connected. We're going to be where we need to be. And, um, you know, but that really can only come when our anchor is in Jesus and what he did for us. So I just really appreciate that. I feel like there's just a lot to just think through um, and just reflect on that you shared. So I'm going to go ahead and say a prayer. And then we'll close with one final song.